Welcome. Uh, I'm Jonathan Liebenau, and I'm chairing this event for LSC Ideas, US, China, and the Global Race to Dominate Blockchain and Crypto te Technologies. I'm a member of the Department of Management at the LSE and also an associate of LSE Ideas and its China Foresight Group. I'm also, relevant to this, an associate of the UCL Center for Blockchain Technologies, where I've worked on issues that are to some degree related to our topic today. Well, given the news of the day, our topic might seem all the more a distant niche of policy and academic interest. However, our governments believe that sanctions are our best or only response to Russia. And Alice Ekman already seven months ago wrote, some sanctioned countries can avoid having to use the US dollar for transactions, therefore impairing the ability of the United States to monitor critical revenue streams to such countries and to enforce economic sanctions. Besides undermining Washington's ability to resort to sanctions as a means of deterrence, the United States would lose all oversight of funding of underground activities, such as terrorism or missile deployment, if such payments are not made under its system. That she wrote in a very, very interesting piece titled China's Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Ambitions. I'll come back to that in a minute. But our speakers today, we'll start with uh, Garrick Heilman, who wrote in his very, very useful primer global blockchain benchmarking study with the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. He cautioned us that blockchain has become one of the most hyped technologies since the internet. It's also one of the most poorly understood. This state of affairs exists despite the fact that significant effort has been made to explain blockchain technology to non-technical audiences through the mainstream media, industry reports, academic and online courses, and other channels. Well, what is blockchain and why are we talking about it now, given that it's such an overhyped thing? Turning again to Garrick's uh, piece, he defines it in terms of it being a version of distributed databases, a form of dealing with data that's now over 30 years old, of which distributed ledger is a form, of which blockchain is a variation. And I think we need to take that carefully into consideration when we think about what the scope and significance of blockchain is. Certainly, we shouldn't be seduced by ideas that it's going to revolutionize everything just because of what it is. And most certainly, we must look beyond the most uh, well-known application in, in Bitcoin. I especially commend the section of Garrick's report uh, debunking common blockchain myths. Going back to Alice, what she wrote that all these developments underlie two trends. First, the Chinese government is currently testing all possible applications of blockchain technology on its territory. This is comprehensive testing, it provides Beijing with a comparative advantage over countries that anticipate potential applications, but that are not yet testing them on the ground. The dual policy of the Chinese government remains experimental in many respects, but nevertheless, the work in progress approach provides the ability to fine tune applications at a fast pace. Second, some of the blockchain applications tested by the government are shaped to support the one-party system and its surveillance and control functions. Beijing is developing a specific type of blockchain surveillance that is not only adapted to the authoritarian political system, but also has the capacity to strengthen it in some areas, such as policing and clamping down on dissent. Well, our speakers today are extremely well uh, appropriate um, for this discussion. Indeed, uh, Tori, Victoria Adams of the Value Technology Foundation, a 
Washington-based think tank and advocacy group, already 17 months ago, had a session that was titled Blockchain in China and the US. And so we have tremendous background and opportunity to, uh, to go further with this topic now. So the order of our speakers is, uh, I'll ask Garrick to speak first, briefly, uh, then uh, Alice, uh, and then Tori, and we'll have a little bit of discussion amongst the four of us uh, while we take questions from what looks like a pretty large audience. Thank you, Garrick. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, this is a huge topic. We'll try to do it justice here in the uh, short time that we have. So what would I like you to know about blockchain technology? Well, we've come a long way, I think, in the, the 10 years that I've been working almost full time on this topic. Uh, but we still have a, a, a lot further to go in terms of uh, both educating people about what it is, what, why it's an exciting technology, a useful technology, what are its trade-offs, its strengths and weaknesses, and, and also further developing and maturing the technology. So uh, just uh, a little bit more about myself. I am the head of research at blockchain.com, which is one of the oldest uh, crypto asset companies in, in, the, in the world, founded in 2011 in London. And uh, or actually, sorry, in, in York, uh, but in the UK. And uh, I've also kind of uh, worn an academic hat during my, my journey in the, the blockchain technology space. Uh, I first got interested in this topic while I was a PhD student at the London School of Economics. Uh, and, and then I went up to the University of Cambridge, uh, where I authored the reports Jonathan mentioned. And then I've been uh, mostly in industry since 2018, although I, I continue to be a, a visiting fellow uh, at the London School of Economics currently. And I've always been just very interested in this question of how this technology can involve and, and impact the world and trying to understand and study uh, the ways that it, it is growing. And it's growing incredibly quickly. I think it's useful just to, to start with that point. Uh, we looked at high level, the growth of the internet from its inception. And that's a debated point. Was it 1971 when Vint Cerf and uh, Bob Kahn invented TCIP? I think most people date the, the beginnings of the internet to a, a later date. Um, but uh, you could argue that Bitcoin uh, adoption is actually growing uh, quicker than, than the, the uh, growth of the internet and growth of PC ownership. Now, of course, um, Bitcoin and crypto assets, you know, are built on top of computers and, and the internet. Um, but, but that's a pretty remarkable, I think, not so well-known stat that this is something that has become, um, you know, not just a niche uh, of, of computer geeks. Uh, it's, we, we're, we think probably well over 100 million people uh, own some crypto assets or non-fungible tokens uh, or other uh, types of digital assets based on blockchain technologies today, which is pretty remarkable given that Bitcoin was founded uh, that, and started back in, in January 2009, so just over 13 years ago. Since then, we've seen a number of other um, blockchains emerge, uh, a notable one, uh, the number two largest in terms of market value called Ethereum is a platform for smart contracts, which are certainly worth discussing. And take us into things beyond just currency or digital gold, which is often what Bitcoin is described as, this kind of scarce, hard digital asset that has properties that are akin to uh, gold, a traditional safe haven asset or an inflation hedge. Um, smart contracts, uh, just briefly, um, I'll, I'll give an example of what a smart contract could do. Uh, I don't know that this actually exists today, but uh, it's one I've used for years and seems to help people understand what a smart contract is. Uh, imagine you're a dog owner, you're busy, you hire a dog walker, um, but you don't completely trust uh, your dog walker. So you attach a GPS chip to the dog and, uh, and uh, the uh, dog walker takes the dog out. And when the dog comes back, that GPS chip sinks through the internet to the Ethereum blockchain into a smart contract, which you can think of as just like a program that's running on top of the Ethereum blockchain that does two things. It verifies that the agreed upon, upon distance, say it was three kilometers was walked. So it checks the GPS data. 
and uh, and then it automates payment to the dog walker. So it issues a payment, and that payment could be in the form of you know the Ethereum native currency, Ether, Ether. Uh, it could be a stable coin, which is a, something we may talk about more today. That's a cryptocurrency that's often pegged to something like the U.S. dollar to have a degree of stability uh, in its price, uh, unlike Bitcoin and, and Ether and other cryptocurrencies that are notoriously volatile. Um, so that, that automation and that payment uh, are kind of two parts of, of, of um, automatic verification and payment are kind of the two parts of this example of a smart contract. But smart contracts can be used for a whole wide range of things. We see a lot of um, traditional financial services, exchange, borrowing and lending now built on top of, of networks like Ethereum. And this is the DeFi or decentralized finance phenomenon. And then really in the last year, we've seen um, an explosion of interest in something called non-fungible tokens. And uh, just briefly, uh, the, the whole idea of a non-fungible token is, is very counter to the idea behind Bitcoin uh, and its fungibility, or like the US dollar and its fungibility, the idea that one US dollar is, is, is identical to another in essence, it can be in interchanged without any friction. Same thing with Bitcoin. Non-fungible token is meant to be unique, uh, something that um, is, is in essence a receipt to something unique that is is uh, kind of uh, has its owner ownership kind of verified on a, on a blockchain network, and we've seen uh, various forms of art, uh, you know, auction for tens of millions of dollars at Sotheby's. Uh, we see blockchain gaming uh, uh, attracting a lot of interest. So owning outright ownership of of in-game digital assets, swords or various things you can collect in a game. Uh, represented as these non-fungible tokens and really, once again, kind of further expanding uh, the way in which blockchain technology is being used and the audiences that it's reaching. And I think that's a really important thing to understand uh, as, we've, as we've seen the space grow beyond just Bitcoin and into other legs of a stool that now support many, many use cases uh, that are continuing to make um, you know, the use of blockchain technology more and more compelling um, for people who, who aren't interested in the monetary properties of Bitcoin uh, or, or aren't concerned about topics like inflation or, or even privacy. Um, and, and it's worth maybe touching on some of the other things that bring people to take an interest in blockchain technology that are relevant to co contemporary events. You know, it, it seems like not a day goes by that there isn't a, a data breach or a hack of some kind, including in the, the crypto space. We often see exchanges where people trade and transact hacked and and funds funds stolen or or uh, data loss so the the crypto industry is not immune to this but just in general our our data our personal id information that we share with service providers is constantly being stolen one idea behind blockchain technology is to uh, eliminate in essence central repositories of data and kind of like distribute um, ownership and control and, and data to individuals. So there isn't this kind of honeypot effect that's so attractive for hackers to, to target. Um, and also offering a great degree of pseudonymity, uh, you know, on blockchains to transact with some, some degree of privacy. And I think this is a particularly important point to, to, to bring up uh, in the context of a discussion around China and the future of things like central bank digital currency. This, this, privacy that that is offered by blockchain technology where you could say uh, in the case of bitcoin have an alphanumeric um, identifier that represents say your wallet but not your real name attached to your funds and, and transactions uh, offers some protection i think from kind of a future panopticon and the possibility that literally everything we do financially is is visible trackable uh, and surveilled and, and possibly used um, in, in bad ways to, to control, uh, stifle discussion, political discourse, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and even going a step further, there's this concept with, with blockchain technologies around censorship resistance, this idea that you can transact without having to gain approval first prior to the transaction. So to use a bank account, typically you have to apply. Uh, there's a gatekeeper 
that's not the case with blockchain networks like, like Bitcoin, where you don't have to apply. You simply need a computing device and a connection to the internet, and you can receive cryptocurrency. You can send cryptocurrency, and, and nothing can stop that. And that censorship resistance, that, that ability to transact, I think is another key kind of thing we should, we should discuss. It's certainly, uh, you know, for, from, for, for policymakers and for, for law enforcement and others, that's, I think, one of the most challenging aspects of what blockchain technology brings to the table is that censorship resistance. But it is something that many people think is incredibly important as we enter this future digital age when so much can be centrally controlled, monitored, and, and squashed. We, we saw just in the past week in Canada uh, a rather controversial move um, by the Canadian government to actually try to freeze certain fundraising platforms and even bank accounts of individuals involved with some of the um, trucker protests in Canada. And, and that move was, was, was uh, debated and, and deemed to be somewhat controversial. And, and blockchain technology, like it or not, does offer a way around some of these ways for um, governments to, to stifle financial transactions or businesses to stifle financial tra transactions. So there's a lot more we can say um, about this, uh, but, but I, I think I'll stop there and, and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Thank, thank you very much. Well, uh, that's, that's a, a good way to start. And uh, I'll ask Alice to, to speak now. I, I hope that either now or perhaps in the discussion afterwards, Alice, you'll be able to tell us a little bit more about how design features of such systems make a difference about censorship and control, uh, because we can see that in China in particular, such design characteristics are being built into the way that blockchain applications are, are being used. And Alice, you have special expertise in this and we're anxious to hear from you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Donatan, for, for sharing and thank you to, uh, to the organizer for the invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here, especially as I'm a former LSE student uh, graduating from MSC China and Comparative Perspective in 2007, already uh, a long time ago. Um, I'm, I'm a China expert uh, working at UISS. I, I specialize uh, in China's foreign policy in particular, and I started to, to be um, interested in, in analyzing China's blockchain ambition because I, I by analyzing uh, official communication, I realized that uh, uh, China's blockchain, uh, blockchain uh, ambition were very high. Uh, when you look at the 13th five-year plan, you know in China you have five-year plan, uh, which are still uh, uh, shaping uh, economic and digital orientation of the country. Uh, China's five-year plan that was published in 2016, um, it explicitly uh, made reference to uh, blockchain. And uh, it then released the first white paper on blockchain technology and application development by the Ministry of uh, Industry and, uh, and uh, uh, Information Technology the same year. Um, but really, since 2016, uh, the CPC increasingly considered that blockchain um, could become an economic and, uh, and uh, political and geopolitical asset for the country if guided well. And the key word here is guided. Uh, why? Because there is a paradox. Why China is interested in, in blockchain, which is by definition uh, a technology that is well known for, for its attributes that are relative anonymity and immutability of the information. Um, why a country which is uh, promoting uh, censorship and propaganda is interested in uh, a technology that is uh, uh, known for its anonymity and immutability. And here's a paradox. Uh, starting from the decentralized nature of the technology and the highly centralized nature of the Chinese political system. China initially saw blockchain as a threat, but considered that to convert this threat into an asset, an economic but also political asset, it has to invest massively in it to reshape uh, it and redefine it uh, according to uh, 
um, uh, in a, towards a frame that, that is uh, suitable uh, to authoritarian uh, regime and context. And in concrete terms, China has invested uh, massively in blockchain development since 2016. Uh, but uh, in particularly since 2019 uh, and a speech of Xi Jinping in a dedicated uh, um, uh, session for members of the Politburo. And it has promoted what I called in, in the study uh, a dual policy uh, in which uh, it is uh, investing in both blockchain in a comprehensive way uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool for various application and in one of the application, which is uh, digital currency. So I will start just generally uh, by, by explaining uh, the comprehensive approach toward uh, China's blockchain, because uh, uh, Garrick in, in the first part had a focus on uh, the uh, financial dimension of blockchain, but China uh, is really uh, active, uh, I mean, is, is investing in the financial dimension of, of blockchain, and but uh, more specifically in other dimensions. So let me list some of the uh, function uh, of blockchain that is supported and developed by China. Um, so um, first of all, China see uh, blockchain as a key pillar of the smart city infrastructure that are currently being built across uh, the country and able to support a broad number of activities, including uh, road network management, public health, energy generation, communication, food safety, environmental pollution reduction, etc. Um, in concrete terms, since 2019, China uh, has uh, considered blockchain as an integral part of uh, the Shanghai Smart City Program. Uh, which uh, helps to manage and store vast amount of data generated by uh, uh, sensors. Um, and in general term, uh, China considered that uh, a blockchain may be used to store a large amount of data that has aggregated rapidly thanks to the increased speed afforded by 5G technology. Um, so uh, smart city governance is one application of blockchain uh, that is supported uh, by the Chinese government. Secondly, uh, China, Chinese government has leveraged possibility and immutability offered by blockchain technology in the field of policing. Uh, blockchain has already been uh, used to verify and preserve electronic evidence as well as store uh, evidence collected during police investigation. Uh, thirdly, Chinese government has explored the use of blockchain for the dissemination and information uh, of information, sorry, dissemination of information. Um, and some instance uh, propaganda. For instance, uh, to give you an example, blockchain-based platform were used for the diffusion of inf official daily updates during COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that the uh, information provided was uh, temple-proof. Um, and um, and um, the pandemic crisis, uh, in general term, provided a fertile testing ground for the expansion of, in expansion of blockchain application. Um, uh, in, in, in over a in over, uh, limited number of, of weeks. Fourth, the government has uh, explored the use of blockchain to facilitate the management uh, of government data and human resources. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, PLA, the People Liberation Army, is testing blockchain uh, technology to manage staff data, uh, boost performance, and in particular to provide soldiers with tokens that have earned um, um, that they have earned and which can be used to collect uh, rewards. Uh, and in law enforcement and intelligence units, blockchain technology is already uh, in use to prevent distortion or leaks. Uh, finally, the government is already using blockchain to gather evidence against uh, dissident online. For instance, blockchain-based platform has been used to gather evidence of those defam defaming Chinese revolutionary martyrs via uh, online, online platforms. Um, all these developments really uh, underline two trends that uh, Jonathan already has, uh, have underline, has underlined in the introduction. Is that first, the government is uh, testing all possible application of blockchain technology on its territory um, in a detailed manner. And second, that uh, some of the blockchain applications tested by the government are shaped to support the one party system. Uh, and particularly its uh, control uh, function. 
uh, of our society, which seems again paradoxical with the uh, initial conception of blockchain. But for China, uh, the idea is to invest in blockchain to redefine its uh, its nature, uh, the nature of of, of uh, the network, uh, to make it, uh, uh, I would say, uh, CPC compatible. Um, and of course, the government is uh, is, is perceiving blockchain uh, from also a financial uh, point of view as it is investing in uh, digital currency. As blockchain in general, uh, the financial uh, application of blockchain is uh, seen as a double-edged word by the Chinese government, potentially threatening its financial sovereignty, but also offering opportunities to advance the growth of uh, China's digital economy and improve the efficiency of uh, transaction, tackle illicit activities and facilitate uh, online payments. So um, in concrete term, um, and, and from the beginning, China had a very skeptical and ambiguous stance uh, towards uh, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin or uh, fa Facebook then emerging uh, cryptocurrency DM. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, China invested to, with the aim to uh, gain global leadership in the field of uh, digital currency under central bank supervision. Uh, to be more specific on the skeptical approach, uh, and, and very recently in May 2021, China State Council called for an increased crackdown on both uh, Bitcoin mining and trading. Um, shortly after uh, three state-backed Chinese industrial associations vote tougher restriction on uh, virtual currency trading. Um, and China's skeptic, this, this skeptical attitude towards uh, cryptocurrency currency come at a time when it's developing its own stake back digital currency. Uh, the digital yuan, as we could call it, officially known, officially known as the digital currency electronic payment, DCEP, is, is envisaged by, uh, by Beijing as a central bank digital currency, uh, CDB, CBDC, and has a legal status as a, as a same legal status as a regular yuan. Um, which is uh, its value is value is, its value is tied to the to the regular uh, yuan. So the digital yuan um, echoes some of features of the Bitcoin, as it enables consumer to use computerized code uh, of money, as money. Sorry, but uh, it's com this computer code is created and controlled by the central bank, uh, not by anonymous Bitcoin uh, miners, um, and. Um, China is not the, is the first country to, to, to test uh, a digital currency and, and, and to think strategically about it. Other countries in Europe, in, for instance, uh, Sweden, are in the process of exploring or developing their own uh, CBDC. But they are uh, behind China, which has already become the first country to test its uh, digital currency. Um, uh, in particular, the COVID-19 crisis gave, uh, gave a renewed uh, impetus to China's uh, CBDC. Uh, in May 2020, uh, Chinese state-owned media reported that design, uh, standard-setting R&D of the DCP function and joint tests have been basically completed. And a one-week trial was carried out during the 2021 uh, uh, Lunar New Year. A nationwide rollout of the virtual currency um, has been uh, launched recently uh, in the margin of the Winter Olympics in Beijing. Um, uh, it's still, uh, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, step-by-step uh, launch, but already um, uh, shoppers have been given uh, uh, so-called red packets containing a digital yuan, uh, and this, this red packet was distributed in several cities to boost consumption, um, uh, and, and they, they covered uh, the enable different scenario uh, to which, I mean, this red packet were enabling uh, the payment of uh, public uh, transport and discount shopping at uh, uh, shopping mall uh, in, in uh, Olympic cities, uh, I mean, Olympic uh, uh, location venues um, uh, in, in recent days. Um, of course, there was a communication uh, part here uh, with central government really wanted to, uh, to, to promote digital man uh, globally and it's still far from being used uh, largely on a daily, daily basis. But still, 
um, it's interesting to note this development uh, because China has very strong ambition in, for the coming years in the further implementation uh, of uh, to, for, with the aim of daily use of the digital yuan um, uh, by its population. Uh, digital yuan is not expected to replace cash in circulation. Uh, it's expected to replace only part of it and current channel of money supplies will not be altered in the short term. Still, in the long term, the digital yuan has um, uh, the potential to substantially increase the central bank oversight of transaction. Uh, because according to a 2019 regulation of the cyberspace administration of China, the banks and electronic payment companies that will dis distribute the digital yuan, already, uh, they are requiring users to, authentic to authenticate sorry, the real name as well as national identification card number. And so the central bank will be able to view data uh, on transaction. So in the longer term, if uh, this uh, channel of payment is used more broadly, it will substantially increase control over the population uh, whose financial dealings will be easily trackable by the central authorities. So that's an interesting development to follow. Uh, I know time is short, so to wrap up, I would just add, would like to add one point on the international uh, ambition of China when it comes to the digital uh, yuan. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, uh, China uh, is hoping uh, to uh, promote the digital yuan uh, uh, globally at a time uh, of tension with uh, Washington. Um, in the long term, uh, the digital yuan could sustain China's effort to internationalize currency, internationalize its currency and challenge the supremacy of the US dollar and the SWIFT uh, system. Uh, we should not be uh, too quick in conclusion here because at this point in time, as the yuan and its forthcoming digital version have not challenged the, the US dollar, China's currency um, makes up about 2% of uh, global foreign exchange reserve compared with uh, nearly 60% for the US dollar. Um, and technical developments alone will not be enough to accelerate the internationalization of uh, the yuan. Uh, uh, policy decision will be also necessary uh, as China maintains a strict regime of capital control. Still, the development of the digital yuan is raising concern in the US and has intensified the debate there on launching a digital dollar. In particular, since uh, Janet Yellen was appointed as Secretary of the Treasury in January 2021, and the title of this seminar is really um, uh, uh, is really uh, referring to uh, China and the U.S. competition in the field. Uh, but China really is expecting to enhance the Jinping's global standing and progressively convince a number of uh, countries to use a digital currency for cross-border exchanges, and in the long term. Uh, some sanctioned countries, uh, including Russia, including Iran, including North Korea, could avoid having to use the US dollar for transaction, therefore impairing the ability of the United States to monitor critical revenue streams to such currency uh, and to enforce economic sanction. Um, and and, and uh, in the same, they, they, they would happily welcome a digital currency of reference including welcome uh, uh, transaction using digital yuan uh, to, to bypass sanction uh, more easily. Um, in general term, uh, various uh, group of country, uh, including countries, some of the countries are members of the Shanghai Corporation Organization who are part of the BRICS uh, country grouping could be candidate for the experiment. In already in 2019, the BRICS country began cooperating on this um, on, on the proposal of, uh, of developing uh, um, alternative uh, 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 um, uh, path for uh, trade settlement uh, to bypass uh, the supremacy of, of the dollar. Uh, this will take time and the digital yuan is far from being a, a currency of reference state, but it's very interesting to continue to monitor uh, China's uh, uh, action and ambition in the field uh, uh, at a time of uh, geopolitical competition um, and bipolarization, bipolarization of the world in, in, in which sanction is becoming a, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, key measures uh, in crisis, including the latest one, uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And, and it's, we're talking about sanction involving a swift payment system, but also um, generally economic and financial sanction. And in this context, more countries will try to find ways to bypass sanction and digital currency is one way to bypass uh, them. And China will surely be happy to offer digital yuan as a, as a channel of payment for, for any countries who may be interested uh, uh, by uh, it. So this raises a number of strategic questions for European countries, um, including for countries who are considering uh, sanction as an efficient tool to, uh, to uh, respond to a crisis in the region and beyond. And I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, it, it's, it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm sure that people will want to read your piece on China's blockchain and cryptocurrency ambitions, where you express, uh, for, first of all, a reminder that uh, technology is highly malleable. And whatever the expectations of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and uh, followers uh, might feel, that uh, the way in which China has been able to uh, experiment with at, with great breadth uh, applications, we see the the way in which the technology comes to serve the the purposes, or at least they're they're exploring these. The challenge that is uh, directly placed to the United States uh, from some of the things that Alice has described is, uh, I, I hope, what we can turn to next in our in our discussion. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, Victoria Adams, Trish, uh, Tori Adams, to uh, tell us from the US point of view, please. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. And um, I, I guess I'll give you the US point of view. Um, so the US point of view is as always uh, complex and multifaceted and many, many uh, different folks weigh in because that is the nature of uh, the US political system. I think that we need to sort of go back and think about how blockchain has evolved within the US to get a good picture of where we are now and where we might be going. When blockchain first appeared on the public scene and in the consciousness of policymakers in 2017, it was seen primarily as a financial issue and an issue of uh, illegal funding for terrorism, for illegal narcotics, uh, all of this kind of thing. And that was the focus of most of the federal government. Now, at the same time, uh, we started to see some interest within the federal government of beginning to use blockchain for other purposes. We saw some experiments in the US Treasury on tracking internal funding. Uh, we saw some things from the Office of Personnel Management of uh, starting to um, be able to secure uh, federal workers' information. And there was a generalized interest that there was something more here and we needed to look into it. Uh, we saw a couple of bills come out of Congress calling on the Department of Defense and the National Institutes for Technology to conduct studies into blockchain, but really nothing more. Now, what happened then with the crypto winter, uh, when the price crashed of most of the currencies, and in the following uh, couple of years, where you might have noticed we had a president who was uh, less than attentive to many uh, governmental issues, uh, was the blockchain basically went to sleep within the federal government. There was very little interest at all. And at the time, um, I was working for uh, consensus um, which is a large blockchain firm, it was very difficult to get anybody's attention. The only way we could uh, was to get a little attention in Congress by focusing on the China threat, the China threat of uh, China's blockchain services network, of the emergence of digital yuan, and of many of the, um, uh, the uh, initiatives that Alice was just speaking of. But even then, we really couldn't get much traction. Uh, we could talk to folks within uh, different committees, we could talk to the blockchain caucus, 
but awareness of things outside was just not there. Uh, DOD, uh, the Department of Defense, did publish a report on it, uh, but again, it, it wasn't really something. So by 2019, I would say blockchain was effectively dead within the federal government, within federal policy. Uh, the most you saw uh, was the uh, some regulatory issues around um, uh, blockchain and uh, currency issues. You know, a lot of cyber, uh, sorry, a lot of crypto going on, and also um, uh, some attention into trying to track the flow of funds coming out of Department of uh, Justice, the FBI, and. Um, uh, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, the tax man, that was also very interested in how to get people to pay tax on their crypto dealings. So nothing was there. It was over as far as the government was concerned. And you could see this in the um, moves of some of the big consulting firms that were focused on the government, where they effectively wound up their blockchain practices that they have been spinning up to expect the demand. Now, this began to change really in about 2019, 2020, and from there. You started to see more interest all around in blockchain. And this was spurred by China's uh, interest and in its uh, initiation of the digital yuan experiments. Uh, what we started to see was um, uh, uh, the Treasury and uh, the SEC and a number of other, uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks, beginning to conduct uh, studies and interest and experiments with the digital dollar. Um, and that is still ongoing, and I would expect it to move very slowly because the threat is seen as a very long-term threat, and the U.S. has a lot to lose. So, there's a very slow experimentation uh, with the folks up in the Boston Fed, and they've been working very closely with MIT. What I find more interesting that we started to see was the uh, revival of interest within uh, the defense community uh, with blockchain. And a number of things were driving this. Uh, one, uh, as blockchain sort of uh, veered off into um, the uh, stablecoin uh, uh, boom and into the uh, rise in crypto prices, uh, DOD began to be interested again in the use of blockchain uh, for things like supply chain tracking. Um, the supply chain that supports the US military establishment is huge and incredibly complex and very badly coordinated. Frequently, one supplier doesn't know uh, quite what another supplier is doing. And this was uh, intensified as uh, Chinese parts and other parts from potentially hostile nations began to enter the supply chain and DOD was looking for assurance. Uh, secondly, there was uh, uh, legislation that was passed that was starting to uh, draw more attention to the provenance of software. Uh, where did this software come from, especially open source? software. And this is occurring within the context of the Department of Defense and, uh, and the Armed Services uh, trying to deal with their own inability to uh, have enough coders to be able to generate the software they needed and relying more on outsourced sources and this um, uh, concept they have of software factories where um, you can develop software for defense applications in an open sense, in an open environment uh, without all of the security that then can be elevated through a series of um, secure channels to finally become adopted. Now, one of the things that blockchain turns out to be very good to do is to track, track the provenance and particular changes in software. And there were concerns that firms might be using uh, Chinese uh, developed software that might contain within them uh, various applications that would spy on the US. So you started to see this interest uh, within uh, DOD that was manifested in a lot of research projects. Now, a firm that I work with, uh, SimbaChain, uh, Simba started out 
uh, doing these R&D projects, working with um, some folks from uh, the University of uh, Notre Dame in Indiana, um, and then expanded into doing a whole range of um, blockchain-based uh, uh, applications looking at supply chain, looking at software bill of materials, this tracking of how software has changed, and even starting to look at uh, 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 um, NFTs within the federal government. And these are actually being used right now within the Air Force gaming community. So you're starting to see this bubbling under again, beginning to appear. But Right now, I'd say it's not at the point where people see uh, what is happening in China as a direct threat, and there's a great deal of attention uh, to what is going on. In Congress, uh, the blockchain caucus is still rather low. The predominant view within the uh, financial regulatory agencies is that this is a, a problem of either criminality or it is something um, that is in the, the bailiwick of financial innovation. And in both cases, it's either track it, trace it, and control it, and the US seems very good at that in behind the scenes, or experiment very cautiously. The Chinese uh, threat is not widely understood or accepted. There have been a few war games on this where uh, various universities have invited the great and good to war game out, what might happen if a digital yuan goes wide, what might happen if uh, SWIFT, the, uh, the main uh, payment and banking system, uh, is, uh, is attacked or uh, uh, is rendered uh, less useful by a, a Chinese parallel system, but there's nothing really there that is generating. So I think right now China is running a race without a really strong competitor when it comes to blockchain technology in the US. And I think the reasons for this are uh, numerous. Uh, first, uh, as I say, there's this general attention to the idea that blockchain is fundamentally a, and, and uh, crypto is a criminal problem. Uh, I have a t-shirt that says blockchain, it's not just for sex traffic and drugs and illegal weapons anymore. Uh, and I have a friend at the FBI who always says, eh, not just, but still mainly. And that's the attitude that you've got there, that this is a problem of regulation. It's not an international threat. Uh, secondly, it, it, there are so many technological threats coming from China that people's attention has focused on uh, uh, the different elements of that. It's very easy to get people's time if you want to talk about AI as a threat from China. It's much more difficult if you want to talk about blockchain because, as the first speaker uh, alluded to, blockchain is still, for most people, quite hard to understand. And in fact, both at VTF, where I do some work, and at Simba, where I do some work, we have stopped referring to blockchain. Uh, when we talk to the federal government. We talk about decentralized systems. We talk about uh, zero, uh, zero trust systems. Uh, each of these elements, you can have conversations with IT people. You can have conversations with people about security. But if you start to talk about blockchain, crypto comes up real quickly. And then that just cuts off conversation. So faced with all the threats coming, uh, the focus on, uh, on criminality and regulation, and the difficulty of understanding blockchain, the US has still yet to develop a coherent, um, <coughs> coordinated approach um, to uh, blockchain uh, and the threat that is posed by China. And I'll end there so we can have lots of questions. Thank you, thank you. That's very, very interesting. Uh, it sort of fits in my mind into a pattern of a number of things that the United States views as uh, foreign, distant, long-term, slowly emerging possibilities. And uh, I'm not going to claim that blockchain technologies are exactly the opposite of that, but I think that uh, Alice describing the use of the of the digital yuan at the Olympics last week is already an example of how these things become tangible and tangible not just in some abstracted 
uh, limited form, but in a, in a way that really embodies already China's ability to identify, track, and control the usage of, uh, in this case, the, the currency. But Alice also pointed out that the applications in, in uh, supply chains, in procurement, in uh, social control, and, and even in social monitoring activities is, is uh, already quite extensive. So this is very, very interesting. Uh, we do have some questions uh, that have come from the audience. Uh, I think that I'd, I'd really like to, to start out, though, with just a, a general question and also offer you the opportunity perhaps to ask each other questions. But the general question has to do with the private versus public source of activity. Uh, so in China, there's a lot of private activity in blockchain businesses uh, versus the, the government initiatives. And I'm, I'm interested in the extent to which this uh, seems to be significant. In the United States, perhaps on the contrary, uh, the development by the US government as, uh, as, as, as uh, uh, Tani has described, um, Tori has described. Tori, you go by Tori, is that right, Toria? Yes. Um, that it's quite limited, but the government is quite limited in, in, it, in its activities. Regulators are developing systems. I've, I've worked with the, uh, the SEC and the, and the Treasury guys on, on some of their things that are supposed to have regulatory significance, uh, but the government isn't very extensive. So we, we see different kinds of organizations involved in different kinds of institutional assumptions behind where this development ought to ought to occur. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear comments about that. And, and, and maybe, Garrick, you might also offer some comment on where you think the largest generation of blockchain developments are more broadly outside of perhaps the US versus China, government versus private sourcing. Who wants to go first? Let me, let me, I've got uh, Tori's attention now. Why don't, why don't you start and then I'll ask Alice to comment on, sure. especially the private sector in, in China, which I'm, I'm quite interested in. So I think the opportunities that the private sector offers in China are extremely attractive. And a number of the you know, blockchain companies I've worked for, uh, they all opened China offices, they all went there. And there's a huge market. Uh, you start to see uh, people looking at payment systems, looking at supply chain systems. The BSN, the Blockchain Services Network, is a very attractive system, especially as it begins to expand beyond China into Southeast Asia. So there's a huge amount of activity. But the question always is, when it comes to China, is to what degree is that activity going to run foul? of the Chinese government. And we saw a number of the uh, internal payment systems come under a lot of pressure. And in fact, things like Alipay seem to have been slapped down. And I think this goes to one of the critical uh, elements of the Chinese government's mindset, which is control. Uh, I think a lot of what is going on with the digital yuan and the blockchain system is not necessarily to challenge the US currency, but to maintain control within China. Uh, I think they saw the payment system was starting to get out of their control when you started to see the amount of payments that were going across there. And they started uh, to realize that with blockchain, it could really get out of control. And an independent system um, that could uh, hide data was something that they just were not prepared to deal with. So do you think the U.S. government has a view on what the domestic, a, a, a virtuous domestic application of blockchain, either within no. payments or outside? No. Okay. No, it just doesn't. It just it doesn't. doesn't. Um, I think, you know, there are people within the U.S. government that have it, and you will see contradictory things. Janet Yellen doesn't like it. Somebody in the Fed does like it. So I... Uh, there are some folks in Congress, uh, especially in the House, who are very keen on it. But you're seeing this, there's lots of experimentation going on. It, 
it still hasn't got that. Now, the states are different. There's a lot of uh, 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 competition within the states to become, you know, the blockchain state. So we've seen that in Wyoming, Wyoming. moving forward very aggressively. We've seen that in Miami, not a state, but, you know, big uh, metro, metro areas. We saw it in Arizona for a while. Um, and I get all of these things all the time from some legislature contacting me saying, hey, you know, Connecticut wants to become Ethereum central. What do we need to do? Um, and it just never seems to go anywhere at the end of the day. So I think um, there isn't really that thing. On the other hand, the banks, the blockchain companies, they're surging in valuation. They're surging in what they do. It's coming. Uh, the government will just have to adapt to it. Thank you. Alice, I'd, I'd be very interested in your view. Sure. Um, I was very happy to, to listen to Victoria's comments and, uh, and, and also the way uh, the U.S. is, is, uh, is uh, strategically prepared and prepared to compete with, uh, with, with China. To answer your question more specifically, Jonathan, about uh, private uh, slash uh, public sector, uh, first, a general comment uh, beyond blockchain, beyond digital currency. Um, China's uh, uh, government is reinforcing its supervision of the economy on the economy as a whole. Uh -huh. We saw, uh, we saw uh, reinforcement of control. In general term, on, on, on private sector, you know, um, uh, party branches uh, are, are increasingly uh, numerous and, and influential within state enterprises, and they've always been there, but also uh, Xi Jinping has called to reinforce uh, a number and the presence of party branches within private enterprises, and more and more private enterprises have party cells within their, uh, their functioning. Um, and the second, uh, uh, restructuring of the uh, private sector. We have seen that in the entertainment sector, in the private education sector, and in the tech sector, to name a few sectors. I wanted to start with this general comment to, to give you, you know, a sense of the context in China. Uh, and in particular, the banking and the financial sector is not liberalized, as you know, and it's not planned to be anytime soon. The, uh, the, the control of the, on the, of the government on, on banks is still very strong and, and foreign banks are, are, have a lot of obstacle uh, in penetrating uh, uh, the, the, uh, the market, uh, as you know. So uh, this is not uh, different when it comes to a digital currency. And, and even more so to follow what Victoria was saying, uh, um, you know, China has had has has uh, double uh, our multi-layered approach. First is is to control and to ban uh, uh, digital currency such as uh, foreign digital currency that it has not created. It was not at the an initiative of and is not able to control or to limit the anonymity on on it. For example, its strong ban on on, on Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, other uh, cryptocurrency that, that it considered as a potential threat. Uh, and, uh, and, and second, China has invested in the creation on, on, on uh, 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 cryptocurrency that are state supervised and, and to which it can, uh, that it can shape, shape in, in a way that it is compatible uh, with uh, its current uh, uh, financial system and overall uh, political system. So uh, we are using the same words, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency, but actually it's something very different <laughs> from what it originally means. And I think that that's the whole paradox uh, here. Uh, Chinese central government is using uh, the term blockchain a lot in its communication, it's using the term digital currency a lot in, in its communication, and it will continue to do, do that with the aim to reshape the norm and standard of, 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 of it, uh, not just domestically, but internationally as well. Uh, so to marginalize any uh, uh, initiative that, that is um, considered as a threat and to uh, uh, support uh, 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 um, a stand, state control uh, type of uh, digital currency. Uh, so, uh, mo more specifically, the digital yuan is not a revolution. As I mentioned, it's, it's tied to the regular yuan. Uh, it's, the value is tied to it. It's not, not a flexible currency. It's not uh, anonymous. Uh, and it's uh, controlled by a PBOC. 
uh, so so that that is the plan and and I mean it's not a revolution domestically neither I would say it's fast it's, it's a new channel of payment um, that that is also made possible by his uh, already widespread use of, uh, of phone payment as well you know digital payment in general term is already very advanced in China uh, thanks to to I would say uh, yeah Alipay and, and uh, Tencent WeChat Pay but all, all these as well are also uh, controlled increasingly uh, to, uh, to operate in line with uh, government priorities and uh, data regulation. So um, um, China is promoting uh, this on its territory. What is interesting is to what extent uh, digital yuan would be used uh, uh, as, a, as, as a currency beyond China's uh, territory. It's very, it's too early to, to, to answer, but uh, you have uh, ambition here to to, to promote uh, digital yuan in, in, in various ways globally. Uh, it's interesting to see in any uh, regional farm, that, uh, especially uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, that was mentioned. You know, you have frequent reference to uh, to both uh, the BSN uh, um, and more specifically also to uh, uh, the digital yuan and. Uh, um, really, I think um, the, the the next two years will see a reinforcement of uh, of bilateral agreement mentioning uh, digital currency uh, mutual recognition. Uh, for instance, when we look at uh, twenty five years uh, uh, long Iran China uh, framework agreement, uh, we see that uh, uh, digital uh, currency is. Uh, is a potential area of cooperation between the two countries. So it's very interesting. Uh, we may see uh, a further cooperation with Russia on a digital currency. Uh, although this is very at the very early stage of cooperation, it's too hard to do, it's, it's too early to, to give details, but uh, it, it's to be followed. And we could even see further development with, for instance, countries like North Korea. China has been. Uh, putting into question sanctioned policy targeting North Korea. So uh, payment system that can help bypassing sanction uh, could be uh, supported uh, at bilateral level. Um, and, and China would be supported, a supporter of this type of agreement. So um, I, I, I really think there is more uh, geopolitical analysis to be made on, on uh, the, the implication of digital currency at bilateral and multilateral uh, level, especially as uh, as uh, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, a positioning of China as uh, as an alternative norm provider in the world, uh, we have to think about blockchain also in a broad perspective. That's why I gave a long list of potential use of blockchain. Uh, financial use is just one, uh, but. Uh, it has a lot of use, including um, non-criminal uh, uh, use, as Victoria was uh, mentioning, uh, traceability of goods, logistics, supply chain, uh, waste management. I mean, you have a lot of uh, applications that, that, that is possible. <laughs> what is interesting is that uh, China wants to promote uh, its uh, blockchain system um, regionally and globally. Um, uh, as a norm, uh, as, as a network that, that is recognized by other countries, so that uh, a blockchain system uh, promoted by uh, the US, if it, if it emerged globally, or some European countries would not be able to impose themselves as normative system. Uh, China's uh, uh, activism in the blockchain field should be uh, analyzed in a broader context of uh, norm competition at global level. Uh, China considered that for too long, uh, uh, Western country has been norm shaper. Uh, they have shaped the internet. They are uh, uh, have shaped uh, you know, satellite system. Uh, they have been uh, advanced in shaping a submarine network uh, uh, system. Uh, and, and in general term, uh, it's time for China to be norm setter. And to be norm setter, you have uh, to be active in uh, in uh, uh, organizations that are setting norms. Uh, but also, you have to be just uh, innovative by being the first to create something and to promote something. Thing. You are a first mover, and by, by that, as uh, by this move, you are shaping norms, uh, regionally or globally, uh, uh, if uh, successful. So I think that's a trend to follow. 
Well, I, I, very interesting, in, very interesting comments. Uh, what's going fast and what's going slow? Uh, you wrote a paper on uh, Sino-Russian uh, relations, and uh, maybe that'll be more accelerated by today's news uh, uh, when uh, circumventing sanctions might become a very tangible problem. Uh, I think that that uh, China was was very much behind. Uh, in the early stages of uh, blockchain development, indeed most software development. And the acceleration of activity and especially its breadth has been impressive. Uh, as you pointed out in your writing, 60% of patents are uh, in, in related to blockchain are, are coming out of China now. And I know that a large proportion of the essential patents, the ones that are relevant for standard setting, uh, are coming out of, of China now. And I think that that's, uh, uh, that's important to, to take into account. Garrick, I'd like to hear your views on some of these comments and in particular, the, the breadth and speed of these applications as you see it. Yes, <clears throat> well, thanks. And uh, just wanna uh, thank Tori and, and Alice for their comments, uh, which have been, I think, uh, on target. Yeah, first high level, yeah, what, what China's doing with the uh, E1 or ERMB, yeah, is blockchain and name only. I want to completely agree with that. If you look at the principles that underpin blockchains, censorship resistance, trust minimization, decentralization, some deg degree of privacy, I mean, my understanding is basically all of that is in essence absent from, from that. And there are real questions around uh, how widely adopted this would become. Uh, not just in China, or, or sorry, you know, outside of China, but in China itself. I think there's some people who would much prefer to use Alipay and WeChat Pay, from my understanding. But the U.S. dollar is arguably winning the uh, digital currency race. Uh, I put out two uh, reports in 2018, 2019, measuring empirically the size of the stablecoin market. It was a small thing at that time, $2 billion, uh, in value uh, represented on these stablecoins that are pegged or linked somehow to typically the U.S. dollar. To make them less volatile than cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, and stablecoins collectively have grown to now approach about the 200 billion size in market value in just a few years since then. And it was the Facebook initiative around Libra to launch its own stablecoin that really purportedly kickstarted the Chinese to rush out their ERMB plans uh, in fear that this thing could quickly go to a billion plus users and uh, would be largely a US dollar, um, you know, kind of instrument. Uh, that, that has since been um, uh, shut down and sold off uh, due to regulatory resistance and concerns about, you know, uh, all sorts of things related to Facebook. Um, but I, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, with, with close to 200 billion in US dollar, you know, linked stable coins, growing very rapidly, uh, you know, arguably the U.S. dollar is winning this digital currency race. And many inside the Federal Reserve and in policy circles would much rather see the private sector lead uh, the U.S. dollar uh, growth as a digital currency through things like the stable coins, through things like private sector created wallets like the blockchain.com wallet, not have the government try to get into the business of creating a digital currency, a digital wallet, and leaving it to the private sector. And I think that dynamic is really important to understand and, and monitor in the months and years ahead. We may never see something like what China's doing in countries like the US that turn it over to the private sector in essence and just try to regulate it. Um, the other thing I would point out is that, you know, while China has cracked down on cryptocurrency, it by no means has gone away in China. Uh, I mean, we roughly estimate that say about 20% of the Bitcoin mining or Ethereum mining that was happening pre you know, the big crackdown in May, into May last year is still happening in China, even with follow on attempts to shut it down. So China is not omnipotent. Uh, they can't completely, you know, control everything that happens in China, especially if there's a pretty serious profit incentive in place. Uh, that's another important thing to keep in mind and why many policymakers and people in government circles see blockchain technology and a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin as something like a wrecking ball almost thor towards authoritarianism because it is so difficult to kind of completely stamp it out. It does offer a degree of privacy and freedom and is aligned with say Western values more so than it is with say totalitarian values. And, and is starting to receive some support from people in 
you know, policy circles on that dimension, you know, could this be something that helps, you know, in this kind of contest between, um, you know, authoritarianism and, and, and Western society. So I just wanted to highlight those points uh, in this conversation. Thank you. We have a number of questions from people who are participating with us, our audience. A uh, number of them touch one way or another on the issue of central bank use of, of uh, blockchain. And uh, Janet Yellen's uh, position notwithstanding, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how the US views these things, but also the way in which the specifically coordinated projects that the Chinese central bank has initiated with neighboring countries like Thai, uh, Thai, um, uh, Thailand, but also uh, with the UAE, and then links perhaps with some African countries, the E-Naira in Nigeria. Uh, maybe Garrick, I'll ask you if you can be brief just to say something about what the architecture is, and then uh, Alice may have uh, things to say about what the intention of the Chinese Central Bank is in pursuing this. Uh, and then may, maybe uh, a, a view from Janet Yellen's hometown. All right. Yeah, I, 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 there might be someone here who can speak more to the architecture. I mean, I'm aware of various working groups and rumors of China partnering with the UAE and trying to maybe denominate oil transactions in this ERMB. And I, I think that's, to my knowledge, still pretty fuzzy and under development um, and, and uh, on kind of the discussion table. Uh, but certainly, you know, there's been, you know, a number of people, Ken Rogoff, uh, economist at Harvard has written about how Africa is going to be a central battleground for something like, uh, you know, the ERMB and, and China using its trade muscle uh, to kind of force countries to transact with the, the digital yuan. And, and certainly one can imagine that uh, taking place. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to the other panelists to maybe speak more about, about this if, if they'd like to. Yeah, Alice, you, you've written something about it. Is, is it, uh, does it have momentum? I'm, I'm not able to, to speak about the ENARA because I haven't not conducted that. research on, on this. So I want to be uh, <laughs> accurate uh, about it and I'm not able uh, at this point in time, but it's a very interesting question because um, we, we talked a lot about China's initiative, but uh, initiatives are burgeoning now in, in a diversity of countries. And the key question is how they will connect and how they will be compatible and, and how they will lead to a, a, a merger of, uh, of uh, digital currency or compatibility, or are we talking about uh, two type of uh, digital currencies and two type of blockchain that are incompatible? And I think this, uh, this or various type of uh, digital currencies and blockchain that are incompatible. And I think this, uh, this question is relevant at a time of uh, digital, digital tension between Washington and, and Beijing and what we could uh, analyze as digital decoupling in various respect. Uh, we are already seeing some countries uh, uh, banning uh, uh, um, WeChat Pay and digital payments uh, uh, supported by uh, Chinese uh, uh, companies, and and and, and uh, we we may see we may see in the future some uh, some countries welcoming a digital yuan and some others uh, completely rejecting banning it, and it's uh, really a matter of uh, of uh, compatibility, not just because of geopolitical tension, but but also because of the normative tension that is uh, behind and. Uh, um, we may be skeptical about China's initiative and development, uh, but I wouldn't uh, underestimate uh, China's uh, potential in the field of blockchain and digital currency, uh, even if it's limited and it's redefined in a narrow way, uh, uh, because as I mentioned first, China has, has made it a priority to promote uh, blockchain and digital yuan development. And uh, second, because it has testing experience that other country yet does not have, uh, or at least it, China has launched a test earlier that many countries have. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and in comparison with the US, China is more advanced just in the strategic uh, thinking about, about, uh, about the topic and, and how uh, it can be implemented. Uh, so yeah, several countries already uh, who are uh, 
um, I mean, several countries in Southeast Asia are interested in cooperating uh, uh, with China uh, when it comes to the Taiwan and and the BSC. And I think we should uh, uh, consider the current period as a potential uh, period of uh, acceleration of uh, either uh, counter initiative. Uh, to react to China's initiative. And I think really, uh, as Victoria, uh, I mean, uh, described, uh, not much has happened under the Trump administration uh, when it comes to uh, uh, blockchain and uh, digital cur currency so just thinking, but we are really see, uh, seeing a waking up phase now, uh, much more active development. And and the China threat is very high on, 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 on the agenda and blockchain is part of, this threat, and I think it's acknowledged now as part of this threat. So it's more about uh, reacting and and testing capacities, and 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 the EU has also, uh, um, uh, I mean, has, has promoted initiative in the field with uh, EBSCI, for instance, and and is is willing to test digital currency, but the testing phase uh, is is. Uh, is starting much later than and than the testing phase that China has launched. So it, it's a matter of uh, of of also experience because experiment and and return on experience because uh, I mean it's it's still a very uh, I would say work in progress uh, period now with a lot of uh, of uh, I would say. Uh, uh, trials, a lot of failure in the field, and uh, and failures are also uh, a way to progress. And 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 uh, China's uh, system is is still very much uh, limited. There's a lot of uh, also technical uh, limitation, uh, but uh, the failure that he is facing is also uh, a way to progress because it it is managing uh, step by step to adjust to to this failure in response. Thank you. Uh, one of the legacies of the Trump era was the acceleration of what had already been a trend in the United States to be negligent about standard setting bodies, and especially international norms and standard setting bodies. And the Chinese certainly were simultaneously accelerating from about 10 years ago, their engagement in these things. From a central bank point of view, this is uh, quite important. Uh, you mentioned Janet Yellen's position on this. Uh, does the central bank in the United States, to, does, the, uh, does the Fed have a clear aim uh, to become engaged in, in any way, I, either with a, a currency or with using blockchain as a distributed database mechanism uh, of an advanced form? I think not, um, although it keeps it pretty quiet. Um, we're seeing the Boston Fed, which seems to have been leading the thinking on this. And so I should say for folks that uh, aren't um, uh, aware of what uh, the, the incredible complexity of everything in the US when it gets, comes to getting anything done, that the central banks are, that the central banking system is in fact decentralized among a number of regional banks. And the Boston Fed uh, has been doing most of the thinking and the work here. And they've been keeping it very quiet. They occasionally ask for position papers or thoughts and comments. And they've been working closely with MIT on the development of a digital dollar. Now, on the other hand, if you talk to some folks in Congress, they'll say, but I already have a digital dollar when I make a payment. What, what are you bringing me? So uh, I think it, this is goes to an important point that one thing Alice and Garrick have both said that blockchain and digital currency and a central bank digital currency, CBDC, are not synonymous. Most of the systems that will emerge will be highly centralized and very much controlled by that central government. They are not giving up that currency. Now, that uh, being said, it will provide a great many benefits. So there's interest in this, but the dollar is in the position of defending its hegemony. So there isn't that rush into it that is there. You know, uh, it, it is very much, let's experiment, let's see what's going on. Equally, China is in the position of challenging, of trying to persuade folks to come in, and is coming with a great deal of money, the investment that Alice talked about and development funds, however unequal and however coercive that can often be, is tremendous. So one can expect to see China using its muscle 
um, to deal with its major trading partners when it comes to being payments denominated in uh, e RMB or e Wang or you know whatever. Um, and that's starting to move on. And that will be as a payment system. And I think if there's one thing we've learned from both an institutional and um, an individual level is that convenience trumps everything. And if somebody is prepared to pay you something in a particular way, you're prepared to accept that payment. Uh, I'm trying to buy something from Poland right now and the arguments I'm going through <laughs> with a Polish guy over how to pay him <laughs> going on. And I'm like, just take my money. Um, so you're, you're sort of always left with this of what's gonna be the lowest cost to you? What's gonna be the easiest cost? And this is where I see uh, a digital Chinese currency that is perhaps uh, coming through Alipay or some unknown thing as being very powerful. If I'm in Kenya and somebody is offering me this payment in the digital Wang, which comes straight on my phone, uh, and it's that's you know easier to get than the exchange rate I'm going to get to Kenyan shillings. I'm going to accept it, especially as it's going along that digital silk road, that digital supply chain that's coming. So I see the adoption as yes, the central bank's going to muscle in, but also Chinese uh, people that are within that Chinese economic. Uh, uh, co-prosperity co sphere, to use a term from the past, uh, might well be uh, willing to just adopt and take the payments. And there might be nothing we can do about that. And, and in, in the case of, of digital currencies, as opposed to blockchain, uh, there are the mechanisms for uh, kind of containing it. But are there really mechanisms for containing blockchain uses once they've become established and, and autonomous. What kind of, of pushback can, can there be? Well, I would say this, that blockchain is neither, it's seen as a sort of libertarian technology, but in my view, it's neither a libertarian nor a authoritarian technology. It's very neutral. So if I am using it to track my supply chain and I'm doing it on a private chain uh, with, um, uh, folks who have been recognized uh, as being the legitimate suppliers, then that is not a libertarian idea. That is not something that's there. <clears throat> and I see that as expanding enormously as business starts to wake up to the different uh, opportunities. Now, I will say, we all thought that would happen a great deal faster than it has happened. And in fact, a lot of businesses have walked back their blockchain implementations. And we need to think about why that is occurring. Personally, I think it's because the technology is really clunky right now. Um, IBM's technology, uh, I believe, is secretly a way of selling IBM Cloud because the amount of money that you have to spend to set it up is such that uh, only the biggest would dare go into that. But when you see things like um, some of the the, uh, the low code applications that are coming in, I expect to see more um, moving in. In terms of can you stop it? Can you stop digital currencies um, that are blockchain based, like uh, all of the stable coins we're seeing, all of the uh, uh, the native blockchain currencies like Bitcoin and all of this? I, I don't think you can stop them. Uh, I think you can push them out of legitimate finance if you're prepared to do that. Um, and I think you can also stop them because they are not as private as people think. What we see with the firm chain analysis, which tracks blockchain uh, changes, it can pretty much now figure out who's getting what there. Because ultimately, uh, as one former colleague used to say to me, as long as you can't buy a pizza with uh, Bitcoin, um, then you ultimately have to change back into fiat. And when you change back into fiat, you enter the world again of financial regulation and tracking. And it doesn't take a genius to be able to track, uh, you know, a billion dollars of Bitcoin gets sold and somebody gets a billion dollars in two or three accounts that they are controlling. And this is what um, the State Department and the various federal regulatory agencies do. They track multiple different indicators and have a very good idea. So when we had the hack of the uh, pipeline in the US recently, they were able very quickly to point out the, the hacker group within Russia who had did it and then seize those funds back again. So um, 
it, it is very difficult to think of this as a mainstream alternative economy. I think one can think of it as continuing on as a low level alternative payment system. And then as Garrick was saying, within the stable kind uh, realm as a intra-business uh, payment. Um, but I still, you know, I would not accept someone's payment in their stable kind. I mean, it's coming back to the initial things of banks in the United States in the 19th century. You had huge numbers of, of what they call prairie banks, local banks that would open and would issue their own currency. And you had to have faith in that bank. And, you know, they would take you into the strong room and show you the gold. And frequently the gold was this thick and a lot of uh, grain underneath the gold to give you the appearance of a lot of gold. And the same with stable currencies. Um, again, it, it tends to centralize it because I want to have faith in my uh, stable currency. I know one uh, very uh, well-known stable currency uh, where the, um, the, 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 uh, part, the individuals who run it, uh, their behavior would suggest that that's anything than stable. <laughs> so... You're back to where you were. You know, are you going to trust it? Um, it it's it's like, a complex picture. I, I know we're running up on time, and Jonathan, Tori, I just wanted to just add a couple things to what Tori was mentioning about um, uh, stable coins. First of all, many of them contain actually in their, their smart contract la language a law enforcement function that can be called. Yes. So like law enforcement can contact a Tether or a USD coin, the second largest stable coin, and say, hey, we think there's criminal activity associated with a stable coin. Freeze that address freeze those funds and that's happened uh so there are ways uh to to police and and interact with law enforcement with stable coins and then the other thing that hasn't received a lot of attention that i just want to mention is the u.s government has kind of made an interesting distinction between um bitcoin and what they call anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies or aecs and so uh some cryptocurrencies and i'll mention a few names like monero for example are in this bucket of AECs, anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies, uh, that uh, the government is not auctioning back to market. So it's treating it more like a cocaine seizure uh, or some other illicit, you know, that you know, Bitcoin that's that's been seized by law enforcement is is uh, returned to the person who was maybe had it stolen from them or is auctioned. That's been the historical pattern. But things like Monero are not being auctioned back to uh, the public. And so that's an interesting development that hasn't received a lot of attention that, that I think is worth mentioning. Um, having said that, uh, you know, the, this record seizure of the Bitfinex uh, funds that were stolen back in 2016, three plus billion dollars today worth of Bitcoin seized, 95,000 Bitcoins. The, the Department of Just, uh, Justice was apparently able to track uh, exchange of Bitcoin into Monero and so there appears to even be some forensic tools available to government that they're keeping, you know, for understandable reasons, a little secret uh, around tracing even AECs and in, in policing that uh, activity. So the bottom line is cash is still king if you're a criminal. Uh, the blockchain has digital, digital breadcrumbs, uh, a trail a record. Uh, even if you think at the time it's secure, if that trail still exists years from now, there may be ways for law enforcement to come back and, and, and find out what you did and track you down. And we know the difference between buying an NFT and buying a pizza. Mm -hmm. Alice, we're out of time, but I'd like to give you an opportunity for the last word. Yeah, sure. Um, I just take this opportunity to answer to uh, very briefly to a question about EU's approach towards uh, blockchain. And I think it's important to, uh, to mention that, uh, that uh, the governing council of the European Central Bank has decided to, to launch an invest investigation phase of a digital uh, euro project uh, that was in July 2021 and, and did we move uh, ahead. So uh, it's interesting to, to take uh, this into account. Uh, a digital euro will be uh, investigated and uh, tested. Uh, it will take uh, probably you know, a number of years uh, 
uh, we are assessing about at least five years. So it's also a matter of uh, time frame. Uh, I think everyone at the end will launch a digital currency that is supervised by a central bank just because it's a, it's a future and it has numerous advantages. Uh, but uh, it's a matter of time frame and there is investigation process, testing process. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, you is also considering non-financial dimension of uh, blockchain application. Uh, for example, it has launched the EBSC, a network of uh, distributed nodes across the EU that will deliver cross-border public services, uh, which is already coming to uh, production, uh, but is still uh, limited in its uh, in its uh, in its use, uh, but so step by step we will use uh, probably BSC uh, to uh, to uh, certify our identity for uh, administration uh, uh, paper processes uh, uh, authentication of university diploma. I mean there is many uh, uh, application of uh, of blockchain, and the EU is aware of it. I would say that in the coming years would gain in investing further in non-financial dimension of blockchain application. It is investing in a digital euro. It will gain in uh, uh, fastening the calendar. I mean, uh, uh, I think the, the pace of, uh, of investigation and testing of a digital euro, but also considering non-financial application of, of blockchain, because in, in, in the end, uh, blockchain is a network. Uh, 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 as the uh, internet is, and, and it is important to be a normative uh, power in the field if you want to, to be able to shape it according to, uh, uh, um, to uh, values and the political system you deem the most uh, relevant. So it's a, it's a financial competition, but most of all, it's a normative and political competition that is just starting. Thank you very much. It's an excellent way to end the session. We've gone over a couple of minutes, but I really think it's been very, very interesting. And uh, I know that the participants uh, were anxious to get their questions in. I think we covered many of those topics. There is a feedback form that participants are asked to consider filling out. Uh, I'll leave it at this and say again, thank you very much for this very, very useful and interesting session. You, bye. Bye.